Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Specialomics Seminar Series 6 again. Today, we are very excited to have Dr. Alistair Boettiger from Stanford University. And uh, Dr. Boettiger received his bachelor's, bachelor's degree from physics uh, from uh, Princeton University. After that, he did his uh, PhD at UC Berkeley in also biophysics. And uh, uh, for his postdocs, he worked worked with Dr. Zhuang from uh, uh, the department of, from Har at Harvard, working on the Murphish technology. And he's one of the pioneers uh, in this field. As you might remember, 2015 papers uh, in Murphish, they came from uh, also Dr. Botier's, Botier's uh, contributions. And after his postdoc, he started his lab at Stanford in 2016 at the uh, Department of De uh, Developmental Biology. And in his lab, he's currently studying uh, a special dichromatin in also model systems and taking the Murphish and uh, these technologies to the next steps. And without further ado, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Boetiger. Well, thank you, Ahmed, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you all for joining us. So today I'm gonna to tell you about genome origami and how you can differentiate a cell by uh, bending its uh, blueprints. So it turns out uh, a lot of what makes us human has less to do with the specific genes that we have, which after all we, we share with a, a tremendous array of model organisms, but rather the combinations uh, and patterns in which we express them. Uh, and as this audience uh, certainly appreciates, uh, these, uh, this is the beauty of multiomics to be able to measure these, uh, these patterns. The information for these patterns lies uh, distributed elsewhere throughout the genome. Uh, and not all of it is uh, promoter proximal, that sequences that lie very far from the transcription start site where the polymerase will actually begin and make a transcript, nonetheless find proteins that control the expression, the ability of that polymerase to engage. Uh, and they, they do this uh, in a, method that is uh, primarily happens in cysts, happens only on the same chromosome. So it's long led geneticists to postulate that the key to understanding this complex long range regulation must lie uh, also in the spatial domain, in this case, in the three dimensional architecture uh, of the genome itself. And that by refolding this genome in different ways, or even in different ways in different cells, one could change which regulatory elements are engaging with genes uh, and change the uh, patterns and combinations in which they're expressed. So it's actually a really exciting time to study genome organization. Uh, do uh, like much of molecular biology. First, the revolutions that the, the high throughput sequencing era has uh, ushered in. And uh, many of these have been contributed by this family of approaches called chromatin confirmation capture, as far as finally understanding the three-dimensional organization of the genome. Uh, and the, the, the brilliance of this approach is to take the three-dimensional genome inside the nucleus uh, and treat it first with an enzyme that chops it into lots of little places, typically restriction enzymes. We've seen others being used today as well. Uh, and then ligate it all back together. And while this sounds circular and futile. Sometimes you will ligate together two things that were nearby in uh, 3D space, but that were uh, non-contiguous parts of the genome. And then you can identify these novel junctions through your favorite sequencing method. So in the early days, just PCR across the gap, and uh, in the days of uh, more feasible deep sequencing, one can just sequence the whole genome, find all of these novel junctions, and map them back. And the method has been really impactful because of the beautiful and surprising patterns that emerge. It's become immediately clear that the genome is not organized in this bowl of spaghetti impression that one might get from looking at electron microscopy, but instead there is a tremendous amount of organization. Uh, and then as a field, we've come up with cute little names for these different features, not particularly important, but you'll see there tend to be boxes uh, on the diagonal, which we call tads. And, uh, 
loops or single points off the diagonal, field likes to call loops and things we call stripes. Uh, what makes all these patterns exciting? First, that there is a lot of pattern and it's reproducible across cell type. A lot of this pattern is actually evolutionarily conserved even between species with, uh, say, for example, mouse and human. Uh, also, it correlates very nicely with some of the genetic maps uh, that I introduced with that we've known from genetics, which enhancers and which promoters interact, uh, and they preferentially line up uh, in these same paths. So while this has been a really exciting, uh, energizing evolution, a lot of work has gone into trying to understand these uh, domains better, to map them in more cell types, to apply them to more genetic problems. There are some critical limitations of studying the genome only through this uh, sequencing approach uh, in the genome-wide version called HiC. First, it requires very large numbers of cells. Uh, some of you will know, I'm sure, there are, of course, single cell variants, like we have for all sequencing methods, but these are, these are quite sparse. This is, uh, very, this is actually the same domain we see here, uh, but uh, as you can see, many fewer cell uh, connections are recovered. And in this case, some of this sparsity is actually intrinsic to the, to the method, that uh, if you ligate uh, sequence one to sequence two, you don't get to ligate it to anybody else, even if those other elements are, are nearby. You also lose cell-cell variation in this approach. So you're just looking at the population average. Uh, and those two requirements together have made it somewhat difficult to use in tissues or embryos where individual cell populations are not super abundant. You may not get enough material uh, to uh, robustly measure the uh, contact frequencies across the genome. We're also looking at only pairwise interactions in this analysis. And several of the genetic questions uh, I opened with on this introduction slide, like, for example, do multiple enhancers controlling the same promoter, do they have to take turn? Do they compete for access? Well, maybe they cooperate, maybe they form a hub. You can see potential multi-way interactions, but if we only know the pairwise, we, we can't distinguish those options. We can't tell if this is, do these occur in only an exclusive subset of cells or only a convergent subset of cells, or maybe they don't care at all. We're also really not looking at the 3D structure per se, we're looking at this population average pairwise contact. Finally, they've discarded the rest of the cell in the process to sequence these junctions, and that has lost us the spatial information within the tissue, uh, which is a, another major uh, defining feature of what makes us an animal, that uh, it isn't just all neurons, where your neurons are placed, and which ones they're talking to, for example, is super important to their function, and we'd like to be able to retain that information. We've lost the RNA as well. So if we're trying to understand the links between the structure and the gene expression, if we look only at the bulk picture, we uh, can't measure those two simultaneously. And finally, it gets expensive, and this is a dangerous thing to say in the flavor of uh, high throughput sequencing, which I think has been one of the kings of making uh, large amounts of data relatively cheap per, per data pit. But this is among the most expensive of the uh, sequencing approaches. Uh, many of these experiments go into the billions of reads, and it's because your coverage is scaling not with the genome size, but with the square of the genome size. Uh, we have uh, I should talk to through this map a little more, but the genome uh, position on both of these axes and what's plotted as uh, the heat map, the color indicates the frequency of interaction between any element and the other element. So the amount of sequence space we have to cover goes is genome squared. And uh, if you want to do a lot of cells and a lot of mutants, uh, this, this starts to add up. So how then uh, we've tried, can we address some of these limitations. And we've tried to complement this with a microscopy approach. The idea was conceptually quite simple, is take that nucleus and rather than chop it up and like get it back and sequence the bits, let's uh, use what is uh, building on a, a much older technology of uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization. Let's hybridize probes to the region of interest and taking advantage of the parallel of evolution that's happened in DNA synthesis it's able now to synthetically design all these probes. This gives you a lot of exquisite control over uh, avoiding repetitive sequences and making them line up exactly to where you want them. And we've already heard a lot about using synthetic oligonucleotides in the last several talks for those who have been here from uh, the ACD bio or the uh, MRFISH or a number of other hybridization-based methods. 
So if you label your favorite piece of the genome like this, then we know we attach food to those oligos a floor for it, much like in uh, RNA fish, and then we stick it under the microscope. We see not this beautiful polymer like I've sketched here, but this tiny diffraction limited blob. And you can zoom in as much as we like, and it, it doesn't get any more detailed. The problem here is, is not that our magnification isn't high enough, but that we've actually reached the uh, physical limits of uh, fluorescent microscopy. This is the physical diffraction limit of light. We are trying to see these 10 nanometer scale folds in the genome with some 500 nanometer wavelength light, uh, and we just don't resolve those features. Now, there's a variety of approaches available to us as microscopists now to bypass this diffraction limit. Uh, and when I spent a, a lot of time, what originally took me to Shao Zhang's lab as a postdoc was this method called STORM, where we can uh, turn these diffraction limited spots into something where we resolve a lot more detail. And while this can be instructive for figuring out how different chromatin states behave differently, and we, we had a, a lot of fun exploring that, uh, it didn't actually bring us back to these dysregulatory interactions of enhancers and promoters. We don't have enough detail to trace through this structure to know where is my gene, where is my promoter, who's interacting at the base of this loop, who's in this cluster. And to accomplish that, we've actually turned to an alternative approach, uh, and it's conceptually uh, very similar to the strategy behind this uh, uh, Murfish approach that. Uh, uh, how Chen, uh, Jeff Moffat, Stephen Wang, and I uh, spent uh, time working on together uh, to look at RNA. Uh, and the, the trick is to barcode each step along the genome and then label these components uh, one at a time. We'll get a large spot on your detector, just like so. Uh, but we can fit the centroid of this spot if we know it's only a single spot uh, to much better accuracy than a single pixel can do that in 3D. I'm just showing the 2D projection for simplicity. Record the 3D position. We then add complementary oligos to find actually a little tail that's hanging off of that floor for we added. And this undergoes a strand displacement reaction, building off some beautiful predictive uh, DNA chemistry developed in the DNA origami field. Uh, and that strips off uh, these floor force and actually leaves your sample exactly how you found it. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, this is uh, for this structural imaging, uh, a really valuable control and uh, not only faster, but more flexible than our uh, earlier approaches of photo bleaching or stripping off the dyes. Then you just add the next spot, we get another spot. It's in almost the same place on our detector, but we can fit the centroid very nicely in 3D and uh, we can see it's moved just a little bit. Uh, and one can continue to add probes, image, strip, uh, and march down the genome one spot at a time, taking advantage of this automated sequential hybridization to walk through, in this case, all 65 steps uh, in a couple of days. At first point, it sounds like it doesn't scale very nicely, and that took a couple of days rather than 20 minutes or so to image an individual domain. Uh, in practice, uh, the throughput is much better than we have in STORM because we can image very many more cells in parallel in that process. So at the end of two days, uh, we have completed our first image, but we have also completed uh, 500 or in more recent experiments, 10,000 or 100,000 different cells reconstructed as opposed to uh, by collecting cells by storm one at a time. So this is our super resolution reconstructed image of the 3D trajectory of the DNA. Uh, to remind you, the, the data is just the centroids uh, of our fits indicated by these little balls, and we've joined them with this smooth line just to guide your eye through them in the appropriate order, because when there's more than 10 of them, I can no longer tell which color is supposed to come after which with the color bar. Uh, we have much better resolution than we did in this diffraction limited approach uh, of a traditional DNA fish, uh, and we also have mapped back this critical genomic information. Uh, so I can plot this not only as a 3D polymer, but I can represent this polymer just that. Uh, as a, a heat map like this. This is no, not contact now, this is distance. Uh, and for a single cell, the only thing I've lost here is the rotational angle. 
which uh, wasn't biologically relevant. This is the distance of all probes to all other probes, which also represents distance along the genome. So uh, in our team, uh, the trainees call this optical reconstruction of chromatin architecture and an homage to STORM for its optical reconstruction. Uh, as uh, I hope you've heard already, this is uh, sequential fish and multiplexing on these omic scales is all the rage right now. And I, I hope you got to see exciting uh, conceptually similar work from, uh, so the citation is showing, uh, from my colleague, Stephen Wang, uh, and also colleagues in uh, Marcelo Noman's lab. So what can we do with this? And are these traces actually uh, representative of what the cell is really doing in the first place? Or have we really only mapped the technical drift that happened in our microscope, for example, uh, over the course of these images? Can we, can we validate the approach and uh, interpret it biologically? So if you look at a couple of these traces, the first observations we find, oh, they're all, everyone is unique. Nonetheless, if we uh, take many different polymers, a uh, hundred to a thousand, and we compute the frequency any two elements were near one another. We can create uh, a population average contact frequency map uh, like this, which is an intentional attempt to imitate the type of measurement being made in the high C. And we can compare it to what is measured by uh, high C, which doesn't have any of this hybridization issue going on, doesn't have any of the sequential labeling. It does have this uh, weird cut and paste and read normalization magic going on. So I didn't expect these to look alike at all, but uh, I was uh, blown away at the quantitative agreement we see between these maps uh, that really do capture many of the same qualitative features that we as a field have been interested in mapping and understanding what we call trad, subtrad, sequence, and stripes. At the same time, we, we actually have immediately learned something more about the genome structure. Uh, it is uh, quite debated uh, what this structure really means and whether every individual cell was going to have this structural organization of uh, tags, much like individual cells have uh, separate chromosome territories. Uh, and uh, what I hope to appreciate even from just those three images is there's, there's an incredible amount of variability. These tags really emerge only as a statistical property uh, and labeling them in blocks with storm is much less evident that that's uh, how it's structured. But here we can really see how many different polymers combine together their different structures to give this 3D organization. Of course, the excitement of doing this by microscopy is not only to get at the single cell variation and uh, be able to measure some of these things we can already measure from IC in terms of mapping tags and loops and stripes, but to also take advantage of that spatial organization that uh, really brings out the magic in development. So what you are looking at now is uh, a little part of one of the most uh, beautiful animals. This is the uh, Drosophila embryo at about 12 hours after fertilization. It's just a small piece of one. Uh, and each of these little white dots that we see here uh, is a piece of the genome that we've labeled. Uh, and then each of those, we can now zoom into the super resolution reconstruction uh, by the ORCA. In this particular example, this is a 330 kilobase domain at about three kilobase resolution. So it's about an order of magnitude better resolution than what I just showed from our work the year before. Uh, now we can not only uh, understand the structural organization, but we can see how it changes as a function of spatial position of tissue. But uh, Leslie, a graduate student who piloted this boy, decided not to stop there with imaging the chromatin structure. She also used the identical technology for uh, labeling the RNA. So this actually done before the DNA, before we opened up the chromatin. Uh, and uh, she sequentially labeled about 30 RNAs, which I'm showing you about 10 here. And if you zoom in on one of these little regions, you get very nice single molecule fish spots. And if you get greedy and try to put too many of them colors in the same overlay, they start to get hard to see what's going on, but we can count these quite nicely. In addition to looking at these mature mRNA, which give us a nice molecular footprint of the different cell types 
that make up this complex tissue, uh, Leslie also labeled the nascent RNA. So the uh, nascent RNA transcripts help us say in this particular cell with this particular genome hold, how did that affect gene expression? How does that affect what transcription is doing right now? Which of these genes are on and which of these are silent that lie within the, uh, the domain that we've mapped along with this dysregulatory organization. You can quantify each of these features. So we can quantify the pairwise distance distribution from the structure. We can uh, count the number of transcripts in the cell and the levels of fluorescence of the RNA present. Here's one cell, here's another cell. We get a, a different profile. And across the data set, again, in about a week's worth of data are about 30,000 cells here, some 30 RNA species in a about a quarter million transcripts. Uh, and in each of these, we've mapped at uh, 3 KB resolution, uh, this 300 something KB resolution. So today, having introduced some of the methodology, I would like to talk you through uh, two biological insights uh, that we've been able to understand better about the uh, role of genome organization and how it can help us uh, ultimately read the genomic blueprint better, now we can see after it's folded who really associates with who. Uh, and the first story will come from a bit of published work. We'll talk about cell type specific 3D folding and how that constrains enhanced motor interactions in axial patterning uh, in this work between the propola. And, and the second part, uh, we'll talk about how some regulatory elements can hop over boundaries. Uh, and this Boundary hopping phenomenon is actually also first identified in Drosophila. This work, though, will take us into the mouse limb. Uh, and uh, the second story is, is not only unpublished, it's, it's unwritten up and unpresented. This will be my first time talking it through in public, so I apologize for any rocky bits, but I look very forward to your feedback in the discussion. So we are part one. How does the genome folding change in development? What you're looking at here uh, is a portion of a, one of the most famous regions of the genome, of the fly genome, which is the bithorax complex. These three genes set up the posterior two thirds of the fly, uh, and they are conserved in mouse and their homologs pattern the posterior portion of the mouse and human as well. Uh, and what we know from over 50 years of beautiful genetics uh, that the expression of these genes is controlled by transcription factors that bind a bunch of very nicely genetically mapped, uh, tediously mapped uh, sites that are distributed throughout the domain. And what let's, so we, we tiled this domain to image the structure and see how it relates to expression development. What Leslie wanted to understand is first, from a simple mechanistic point of view, do these enhancers form loops to the promoter? like we draw them in our textbook. Second, how do the enhancers actually know which gene to interact with? What are the directive signals? Maybe, maybe they interact with everything. Uh, and finally, how, how is this set up in a cell type specific manner? Is structure regulated in a cell type specific manner in this domain? And here again, I think the microscopy has a, a couple of strong advantages. One, we, we don't need a large population of cells in order to look at structure or to look at the statistics uh, of structure. Uh, so uh, we can do uh, quite a lot actually, even from a, a single embryo or a handful of embryos. Uh, we can also compare different populations in the same experiment. And this is actually a really nicely controlled method uh, for seeing how structure changes and what structural changes are associated with different cell types. So uh, a certain aspect of the structure is related to just being a polymer. So for example, in many of these, almost all these maps, you'll see things are primarily high contact near the diagonal. And as you go further away, things are further away on average in 1D space, though on average further away in 3D space. But we can also see what features uh, are cell type specific in their structural change. And we can do that by looking at ratios or differences. Uh, and we have the freedom to select which cell types we'd like to compare uh, based on uh, positional information and expression information. So we'll show you first here the, 
most anterior of these cell types that expresses any one of these genes, the most anterior gene to turn on is UBX. Uh, so we're looking at its, the uh, change in the structure uh, relative to the silent cells uh, in distances of nanometers. And what I hope you can appreciate here as well, uh, we here we know from genetics, UBX is the only gene that's on. Uh, I've colored it green here to indicate that. And we can see it's spatially separated away from the rest of the domain, away from the, uh, the silent cells. We also know the enhancers of UBX from genetics that are responsible for driving expression in T3. I've highlighted one of them here. Uh, and interestingly here, we can see, well, this guy is making enriched contact with the promoter, uh, which sits over here. It's, it's not doing so in a loop. It's not the only thing that's making contact. It's making preferential contact with the whole gene body and the whole domain. So in this, there doesn't seem from our first example evidence for these, these stable enhancer motor loops. If that were true, we would expect to see just a red dot or not a whole red box. If we look at individual cells, uh, uh, a number of them capture this property. As mentioned before, the structures are quite variable. So not all of them show exquisite separation, uh, but here we can see the uh, separation of the UBX domain from the rest of the gene body. If we look in a slightly more posterior cell type, these are now the first abdominal segments. UBX is still the only gene that's expressed out of the three, but it's expressed at slightly higher levels. We can see under the structural map that this promoter has actually switched. Uh, it's now spending a lot of time in this box uh, where it's preferentially interacting uh, with all three of these upstream enhancers. Uh, and these upstream enhancers uh, genetically are functionally important for this increased expression of ABDA we see in uh, A1 cells and still remaining segregated from the rest of the domain. If we continue to walk a little more posteriorly, we see a little new domain forming here. This contains the gene ABDA, which is just not expressed in the more anterior. It's expressed for the first time in these cells. And we can see it's associating with its downstream enhancers, which are precisely the ones genetics told us uh, are important for A2 expression. And if we march even further back to A3, uh, we can see that these enhancers that genetically are important for A3 don't enter the contact domain until we move into that cell type. Another point of interest in these cell types, both UBX and ABDA are expressed, uh, but the two domains are not interacting with one another. The two active genes are not getting together and saying, let's have a little party together, we're all on. Uh, they're keeping uh, themselves to themselves uh, and interacting explicitly with their own enhancers. I won't take you through in detail uh, each of the different segments, but it turns out that uh, of the 10 different uh, cell types set up along the anterior posterior axis of the fly, uh, each of them has a unique three-dimensional structure which connects these promoters with a unique combination of the enhancers. And I'm often asked, was this, uh, does the structure uniquely predict then the, the cell type? And uh, here I think that the, the answer is actually uh, no, not on a single cell level. If you look, let me unpack this a little bit. If you look at an individual cells from say the third leg or the first abdominal segment, they uh, uh, it would be, I think, hard pressed to say this one is definitely a T3 and that one's definitely an A1 and not the other way around. Nonetheless, if you look at averages across these diverse ensembles of structures, these averages are distinct. So it is the, it is the repertoire of structures that distinguish cell types. And I like to think of this uh, for an analogy. If we were to watch two different dancing groups, uh, we have dancers here who like to do the waltz. These dancers like to do the Charleston. And you look only at a snapshot. You also may not be able to reliably tell uh, which dance, what type is happening. But if we have an ensemble, even if they're an ensemble of snapshots, it is the ensemble of moves that make the dance. And it is the ensemble of moves adopted from these dynamic polymers that are exploring many different configurations that are also contributing to that cell type. We'd be so bold as to speculate that perhaps the ability indeed to convert between all of these configurations, some of which look quite like one another of a different cell type, is, is, is equally instrumental uh, as it is to the dance into being able to uh, 
perform the right job. So what are the implications from this first part, if I sum up? First, we find uh, no evidence in regulation of the bithorax complex with these well-characterized enhancers for a stable enhancer promoter complex. Uh, this contrasts what we've drawn in a number of textbooks about transcription factors binding the enhancer and making uh, interactions uh, with other complexes bound at the promoter, which may be stabilized by additional factors like cohesin into some regulatory loop. However, we do see that the regulation is proximity dependent. We see preferential uh, proximity of the enhancer in the cell type where it's active. So it's not that space has nothing to do with it, which is uh, another uh, question, issue that has been called into question lately in the community. If it's not enhancer motor loops, what is it? Well, we see these, these domains, and I thought I'd pull up some more examples to get a clearer picture of what's actually happening in one of these contact domains. And if we uh, look here at uh, a cell from this uh, anterior, we see here that this, this region of increased contact between uh, UBX and its upstream uh, enhancers is uh, not happening as uh, it's not a it's not a cluster where everybody in every cell is simultaneously near one another. It's actually still quite a decompact part of the polymer, in which there are individual pairwise contacts. And if you just average enough of them together, these pairwise contacts are still preferentially occurring in domain, not between domain. So it is not that the whole thing has collapsed, but rather that it's doing something more dynamic, like scanning a defined region where you repeatedly make contact with the same uh, portion of elements and, and avoid the others. Finally, these enhancer promoter interactions are controlled apparently by elements that bind neither the enhancer or promoter. If we look at these boundaries that we see that separate enhancers and promoters, None of them in this case are enhancers or promoters themselves. Uh, they do correlate to some other uh, binding proteins uh, and one that has been of great interest in setting up uh, mammalian borders uh, also here nicely co-localizes to all of these borders here in Drosophila. This is the line up of CDCF and the uh, cell borders. So do these I've shown you there are structural differences that occur between cell types, but you might still be wondering, do those structures actually matter? Maybe they're all just downstream correlates of uh, the processes that are really setting up the cell type uh, specific regulation. And to investigate this, uh, Leslie here examined a fly that uh, where we mutated uh, a small very piece of the boundary of the domain uh, that is neither an enhancer nor a promoter. So the, fly, the image here on the left comes from uh, wild type animals with an unedited domain. And you can see this nice separation between the regulatory domain of UBX and ABDA. This is now the just population level uh, from these cell types average distance, not the uh, difference maps we were showing before. And if you look in the mutant, we don't have this uh, evident boundary uh, in interaction frequency. And you can also see this in uh, examples of individual cells. With higher frequency, we find quite nicely segregated domains between UBX and ABDA and wild type than we do after the deletion. But does it matter? So first, the deletion, at least, the voter element is not only there by coincidence, it is uh, functionally changing the interaction frequency. These contacts went up. And then if we look at expression, in the wild type, while well, we find these two genes are both expressed in all of the cells uh, of both of these embryos, they are in fact expressed in different patterns in wild type. So here, the cells which express high levels of UBX express low levels of ABDA and vice versa. But if we look in these boundary deletions, uh, we can see that those differences have been almost entirely erased. Now we see instead of the sort of alternating high-low patterns, really the same expression from both genes, uh, consistent with what we expect if these newly formed contacts between ABDA enhancers and UBX and vice versa are cross-regulating the uh, genes that have adopted new targets. Uh, 
So it would appear the, these boundaries not only change interaction frequency, but those changes in interaction frequency have transcriptional effects. And a beautiful thing about the Gestapola is we can uh, grow them up and also look at phenotypes. These actually have extremely strong phenotypes. This, this deletion is homozygous lethal, and it's, it's almost lethal even as a heterozygote. So it's not just a uh, loss of function. While most of these uh, genes one can get by with uh, one copy, having a little bit of this cross-regulation uh, really screws up the, uh, the animal uh, development. Uh, and they don't, they don't walk very well, and they can't fly, and they have a lot of other uh, difficulties in uh, keeping the stock alive. That concludes the, the first part of my talk on the uh, spatial folding uh, during development and axial pattern, uh, where we primarily saw how enhancers were constrained in their spatial organization in different cell types uh, to interact with particular promoters. We know, however, of some genes that hop across these boundaries, and some enhancers that can hop across the borders that we have mapped uh, by HiC and by microscopy. Uh, and uh, these remain a challenge and a controversy in the field then to understand, so how does this work? Uh, and how does this jive with what I just told you about those borders having uh, functional significance in terms of shaping interactions and in terms of shaping expression? And to take this down, uh, I'll show you an example we've been studying, we're drawn to from the mouse system to complement the, the fly system, uh, where again, the genetics have uh, nicely been done by uh, a number of groups that have gone before, uh, especially showing you work here from Guillaume Andre uh, and uh, Stefan Rondelos' teams. Uh, so here we have the gene PIDX1. And PIDX1 is uh, important in hind limb development. If it's misexpressed, your hind limbs start to look more like your forelimbs. Uh, and one of the enhancers that's important for this hind limb specific expression uh, is uh, this enhancer, the uh, Andre's group called PEN. Uh, and if you clone this PEN enhancer, uh, it actually drives, it has the, it's active in both hind limb and forelimb, but Specifically in hind limb, it's able to physically interact with PIDX uh, and to drive this hind limb specific expression. And to do so, it must navigate uh, these multiple tad boundaries uh, in order to reach over to PIDX. So how does that happen? Well, we, uh, another graduate student in the lab, Zhu Chao Hong, took uh, mouse limbs, cut them much the way we were cutting the fly embryos, uh, and looked at the three-dimensional structures in hind limb and in forelimb. Uh, and if you average all the structures, we can see the high level picture, they look very similar. Uh, we can see these different tags that were also previously mapped in the capture high C I just showed you. But because these are nicely measured in nanometers, we can subtract the two, again, as we were doing before, and we can see which of these interactions are enriched specifically in hind limb versus forelimb. And this is something that is uh, a little more dangerous to do uh, in high C to subtract your uh, data sets when they're in arbitrary read counts that are self-normalized to one another and not in absolute nanometers. But that's a discussion for uh, another presentation. And uh, ha having done this uh, ratio here, what you see in red are regions of the genome that are closer in hind limb, what are in blue or closer in forelimb, uh, we can see that these tad boundaries are actually stronger uh, in a hind limb. So this really puzzled us, uh, which I have in the title, the, the borders are actually stronger in the cell type where this interaction across the border from this distal enhancer to promoter is more frequent. So, so how does that work? How do you increase the interaction by strengthening the boundaries of these things uh, in between? We can also see here a number of uh, additional enhancers of PIDX1 that pick up uh, enhanced expression, I mean, enhanced contact, sorry, in hind limb. Uh, and finally, is a nice control comparison. This, this upstream uh, gene neurog here that is quite close to PEN is actually interacting less uh, in the hind limb than in the forelimb. Another nice thing about the microscopy is you can quantify these differences. Uh, because we have individual cells, we can associate statistics with this quantification. 
uh, and ask uh, how substantial are these differences and what's the absolute frequency of cells that the individual interactions happen. Uh, as we saw on the fly, uh, none of these interactions are stable loops. Uh, it's a substantial minority of the cells that have any one of those contacts, but the individual enhancer contacts are substantially more frequent still in the hind limb. Uh, and if you do increase this interaction frequency in the forelimb, you will misexpress this gene PIDX. So we thought of three hypothetical explanations for how this bypass of borders might happen. The first model was, well, maybe these are more flexible pieces of the genome and they can, they can loop out of the domains. There's just the chromatin's a little more decompacted. Uh, it's not all wheeled in and stuck with the rest of the packed nucleosomes in there and that enables these to be able to loop out of the domain and make some long range contact while keeping these domains largely intact. So this is our first hypothesis for uh, how do you bypass borders. A second hypothesis was maybe a subset of the cells lose the border. As we already saw in our, all of our previous analysis, uh, every cell looks different. None of these borders are present in 100% of cells. So if they're preferentially lost in hind limb, perhaps by a more dynamic motion of the insulator, for example, between them, uh, then the domains would merge and this would facilitate the interaction between them. And this was uh, my favorite model going in. And a, a third hypothesis was, well, perhaps you can fold this chromatin up in such a way that somehow we keep the domain separate, but we allow the promoters and enhancers still all meet in the middle, that we can stack the domains to create these uh, hubs that uh, allow enhancer promoter contact. So we next dove in with these three hypotheses to the hundreds of thousands of cells that Si uh, Chao had collected in both hind limb and forelimb uh, to uh, look at the three-dimensional structure and see if we had support for it, uh, any of these models. So starting with the, the looping out of the domain model, we do indeed find some individual cells that appear to do this. So here is this, the red PIDX1 domain is uh, mostly intact as a domain here. So it's the the pen domain and here are the enhancer and promoter kind of hopping outside the domain making this connection. However, it's relatively rare. We see this in only, you know, less than 20% of all of the uh, cells that actually have an enhancer motor contact in the first place. So it, it clearly can't explain the majority of the time these enhancers and promoters are interacting. Which brought us to the second model, maybe the domains merge. And indeed, uh, a substantial number of cells show no clear separation on the single cell level of these different tags. And if we average those together, we can uh, look at all of the merged cells or the not merged cells where these boundaries are still intact. And the idea was, so maybe, maybe this popping off of the insulator in some cells is allowing this interaction. Well, if that were true, first we would expect it to account for a reasonable fraction of the enhanced motor loops. And, that's, that's looking much better than it did in the loop out hypothesis. Uh, it's about 30% now of all enhanced motor contacts seem to occur in the context of such a merged domain. Uh, but uh, it's not specifically elevated there in hind limb, which might be getting you a little worried already. Does the merging improve the probability of enhanced motor contact? If we look explicitly at all the merged cells versus all the non merged cells, is this uh, substantially enhance the ability of the enhancer actually to get to the promoter. Because we have the 3D structure, we can look at this too. And we do this through this conditioning here and look at relative risk with the odds ratio and ask how predictive uh, is it that uh, once you emerge, you have this enhanced motor contact. And actually, sadly, it's not predictive at all. Uh, you're no more likely to have an enhanced promoter contact if you fuse these domains than if you haven't. So that's not looking so good for this hypothesis. And finally, uh, how, how common is it, is it en enriched in hind limb to help explain this hind limb specific activation? Uh, and that's also looking the wrong way. Uh, it's pretty similar, but it's a little bit biased to actually happen more domain merging in forelimb, consistent with what we saw previously with these borders also being stronger. So it's not looking good for the merged domain hypothesis, which left us with only one hypothesis to go, uh, stacking these domains. Uh, and again, we find examples of cells that uh, 
the domains look relatively separate uh, and the borders and the promoter elements uh, all manage to accumulate at the place where the domains meet. And we can ask the same series of questions. What fraction of enhanced promoter loops actually occur within the stack domains? And there's a couple ways the domains can stack. There's actually a couple tab boundaries between pen and uh, it's the enhancer and its target gene pit X. Uh, and both of those are actually relatively common, 30 to 20%. We have nearly 50% of uh, enhanced motor contacts occurring in the context of stacking with one border or the other. Does it matter for the contact? Does this actually improve our probability of predicting enhanced motor contact? And in contrast to what we saw with the merged domains, we actually have a significant increase uh, in the probability of having a contact. Plenty of the times you have the domain stack, it hasn't brought the enhancers promoters together, but uh, it does increase the odds that we find them together. And if we actually condition the other way, it decreases the odds that we find them together. Uh, and this is more common in high limb. It's also substantially more common in high limb than in poor limb. So from this, it appears that our, our answer for how this uh, distal pen enhancer gets over all these boundaries is in fact that. Uh, by uh, forming them into many different domains, which might be happening by this process of loop extrusion, I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment, into separate loops, which arrest on these carefully positioned intermediate boundaries. You create a system that brings all of these uh, boundary associated enhancers and boundary associated promoters all into a, a little axial cluster here where they're in proximity and they can regulate. Well, at the same time, separating away elements that are lying in the middle of the domain. So potential enhancers here can't interact with these promoters or potential promoters can't be activated by these enhancers. So stacking the domain seems to be a nice way to actually uh, also achieve specific regulation and bypass these borders. Can we find any more evidence in the data about this uh, idea that the borders are preferentially stacking around some central axis. Uh, another test that Dennis Duchow did on these data is to condition on all of the cells that actually have uh, one of these border interactions. So PEDX1 has not joined the enhancer with the say and it's joined one of its intermediate boundaries. And see what the and then see what other contacts come along for the ride that are enriched in cells that have this contact. And you can see a few things here in contrast to the those without that border. First, these enhanced surf motor interactions are more frequent. So here, here is pen and pit X, and that is happening at higher frequency. So are these other enhancer contacts. But perhaps the most striking feature is still these stripes. And these stripes, they, they follow a stripe that we can, we can see a much fainter stripe in the population average data. And uh, we already had a postulate from the community based on modeling of how that would happen, that it would happen by these sort of scanning mechanisms of one domain being scanned along the rest and thus seen at higher frequency. But uh, these data are telling us something different. Because in this case, all of these cells that have this stripe, they already have a contact between these two elements. So it can't be one loop scanning across. This is more consistent with the whole thing meeting at a central axis uh, in the middle. Uh, and in doing so, PIDX1 is simultaneously closer to everybody else. The uh, contact point border here too is closer to anything else uh, on average than two random points because it is uh, literally worked its way into the center of the cluster. So my, my last few minutes. Uh, I'd like to discuss our thoughts on what molecular mechanisms can actually be leading to this preferential formation of stack domains. Uh, and here uh, we turn to molecular dynamic simulations building off of these beautiful open to see software packages written by uh, Jeff Fundenberg and Max Mikheyev and colleagues uh, originally from uh, Leon Murdy's lab. Uh, and uh, the, the model here is to assume there are these proteins, we believe it's what cohesin does, that it can find on the genome and it uh, extrudes little loops, which is what you see here in color. Uh -huh. And it does so until it meets one of those CTCF sites and stops at the block. Mm -hmm. We ask uh, what properties of this simulation might contribute to the formation of these stack domains. And the first thing we explored was, oh, well, maybe if there was just enough cohesin, they would all cluster together. 
Uh, and while well, you can create maps that look somewhat like the, the data, the hypothesis there is actually everything is close together at once, which is, which is not what we see. In the interest of time, I won't, I won't dwell on that model. Our, our, our second model is, well, maybe if it's not the cohesion, what if the border strength is actually higher? The CTCF is more occupied in these uh, posterior cells in the hydrogen. Uh, and once again, we can uh, simulate these structures we can actually look at the relative frequencies and we can see we recapitulate many of the patterns that we uh, see in the experiment for seeing higher contact between the enhancers and promoters, uh, even though the borders here are stronger. Uh, I think this is more evident here in the difference map where you can see to these uh, borders are stronger. There's less interaction, they're further in the 2x, uh, but there's more interaction right at the boundary. Uh, including the sites of the edX pan enhancer and the gene. And we can again recapitulate these uh, trends that we observed too in the uh, data that having one of these interactions substantially enhances the probability that uh, the enhancer and promoter are also in contact, having a border contact, and that this preferentially happens uh, in the hind limb cells that have more CTCF. I'll close with two slides. Uh, this is a very exploratory uh, prediction, but I, I did not expect that stronger borders and stronger boundary elements between the enhancer promoter would, would really contribute to getting across. But a hypothesis that that suggests is that, well, maybe there really is more CTCF in the hind limb. And this may not be true, but if we, uh, we look at the genome-wide uh, CTCF chip seek from forelimb, and hind limb for these domains, and we subtract them, or we look at the ratio, we indeed see that uh, uh, all of these peaks do look a little bit more occupied in hind limb. So maybe that's even giving us a mechanism uh, by consistent with the prediction of the model that these, these borders are stronger, that stronger borders really facilitate border bypass, uh, and they do so uh, only for the locally tethered elements. And we can see that in this, uh, this simulation as well, where the boundaries are more frequently occupied, uh, they preferentially form these clusters or hubs of all of the cohesins together. And if the borders are coming on and off, they're less likely to all aggregate into a hub uh, and get the enhancers and promoters in the same place. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. I've shown you today that uh, cell type specific polymers dance. Uh, and these dances shape gene expression. And I've used the word dance there to remind you it's an ensemble of structures. Uh, that enhancers and promoters do not form stable loops. And we think this is true actually in, in, in both parts. These are highly dynamic structures. But in the context of the border bypass, for some enhancers do act across CAD boundaries. And at least in the investigations of PIDX1, combined with our modeling, it suggests that the Border associated enhancers and promoters are more likely to hop borders. And enhancers and promoters that sit in the middle of the domains, like those we saw in the in the fly in the first part, are less likely to hop the border. And with that, I would love to acknowledge the trainees who have led the work, sources of funding, and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, this is an amazing talk. Thanks. Um, so I do have a few questions, but I would like to see if audience uh, would like to ask questions first. You can either put it in the chat box or you can just uh, go ahead and unmute and, and ask. Uh, GC, raise your hand. Uh, you want to ask? You can unmute yourself. Oh, hi. Uh, so this is a beautiful talk. I really enjoyed. Um, so I have a number of questions, but uh, for the time being, uh, probably just to uh, ask two relatively short one, I guess. Uh, I guess the one question you mentioned in the first part of the talk, you talk about uh, you know how this uh, uh, different uh, uh, along the uh, just off a lot of different part of the body, how this. Uh, uh, different genes, they are uh, selectively activated and that highly correlated with the 3D structures. Um, and um, the, uh, I was wondering, um, 
would you um, sort of um, postulate uh, or maybe based on the data uh, suggest that uh, are there any general properties of the genes that whose regulation are down regulation is dependent on this uh, you know 3D structure organization changes versus those are not I mean do you see any specific differences feature differences that's between those set of genes so that we yeah. know if I if I paraphrase uh, the question asks uh, uh, are there uh, any specific properties to let us know which genes or which portions of the genome are going to have these cell type specific folds and cell type that leads exactly. to the cell specific regulation yeah uh, yeah. I do think so. We, we preferentially looked at some developmental control genes that are master regulators. They have a lot of downstream targets and they have a lot of upstream regulation. And I think these genes, like the Hoxcom genes, are under some special pressures uh, to uh, compartmentalize that regulation. Uh, and indeed that this is uh, not something uh, all genes need to interact with. Uh, some of the other factors we've looked at, uh, including famous examples in fly, like even skipped, regulated by several different enhancers. Uh, we actually find uh, similar contact frequencies among enhancers and promoters that are active as among those that are silent. So, right, right. so that makes sense. So, so I guess the question is uh, more specifically is that, uh, is there like a, a specific, the genome organization way to put the genes, develop the genes in there. So that's, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, automatically is regulated by this uh, mechanism and not other mechanisms. So yeah, like I think some of the factors that get recruited to these help give it a little bit more dynamic. So in the context too of bithorax, uh, the uh, cell type recruitment of polycomb across this domain is one of the major contributing factors <laughs> to the cell type specific folding uh, that occurs. Uh, and actually a lot of the enhancer promoter specific boundaries that line up in those cell types are in some sense hardwired in. Uh, UBX is talking to UBX's enhancers and ABA is talking to ABA's enhancers. And it's only when they all get silenced by polycomb that they all get shoved into the, this big interacting conglomerate. Uh. Okay, so if, if, if it's okay, I'll ask a second question, uh, which is uh, in the second part of the talk, you have, have this beautiful model about this uh, stacked uh, domains. Uh, that I, I think I love it. It's a beautiful model. Uh, if I understand correctly, the way that you uh, come up with this model and uh, validate that is primarily based on this uh, uh, pairwise contact uh, Matrix, correct? Something similar to the high C, right? Uh, I would say it's really looking at three-way interactions. The, the trick is to condition on two and ask what happens in the third. Oh, I see, I see. And we would love more sophisticated ways to look at it. I think part of that reflects our naivety in analyzing the data. But, but to me, what's convincing and what distinguishes the border association is you say, when I have this border, when pidx ones borders have all lined up, now the enhancers and promoters contact, which is a three or four-way uh, interaction I statement see. that I can't make in the capture high C in the pairwise. Cool, I see, I see. Thank you, sorry. Yeah, I think uh, Stephen Common, uh, beautiful work, Alice there. <laughs> so as we are meeting, meeting maybe I can also ask a quick question. So beautiful work, I also really enjoyed. So the agreement between the, the single cell chromatin details versus the uh, high C chromatin details, they're actually very like surprising. I really enjoyed you describing all the mapping. So, but I, I have two kind of, I'm curious about two major things. One is the sensitivity and capture levels of these technologies are different, right? One maybe captures only a few percent, the other one maybe captures like 90% efficiency. And uh, second, uh, they have dropouts, right? And they don't necessarily like have the same map. Uh, and um, uh, I would say maybe third is the single cells. Is it always a kind of sum of like thousands of cells? And when you start to see these patterns, like is it like if you do it for one cell, does it show this pattern? Or do you need to do it with 100 cells? Yeah. 
I'll ask those, answer those maybe in reverse. How many cells do you need to see a pattern? It depends on the number of, uh, it depends on the strength of the pattern we were looking at in the first place. Uh, so for example, uh, chromosome territories, you can see beautifully on a single cell level, they're very well partitioned. Uh, TAD boundaries depend on the, the strong boundaries. Uh, we can pick up relatively nicely with 100 cells. Uh, and then some of these lower frequency differences in interaction, uh, we really do need 1,000. Uh, we have some data sets we pushed 1,000 to 100,000. Uh, and uh, uh, there, are, there are diminishing returns on the detection of, of new boundaries at that level. I see. And how about the sensitivity level? Like, since there are yeah. two different, is there any normalizations that you need to do or things yeah. like that? Yeah, the sensitivity is a great question. It depends on the metric wants to do. One of the ways we compare them, the pairwise interaction frequency, there uh, is actually quite insensitive to the detection efficiency. So in a given fish experiment, actually, if you have relatively sparse detection, the dropout tends to be rather random. Uh, Love to understand that it's kind of convenient uh, that it averages out well. Uh, and you simply need more cells to get good agreement with the high C. Uh, if you label better, you can get good agreement with fewer. If you want to ask one of these multi contact questions, like we were trying to do with the PIDX one, what's the context of when this happens, who else joins? Or you want to measure the 3D shape or size, is it compact or spread out? Uh, then the detection efficiency becomes very important, but we don't have a correlate of those measurements in the HiSea data in the first place. So what HiSea seems to be measuring seems to be relatively robust actually to its high loss uh, detection rate for looking at contact. I see. And uh, a relevant question, to trace your structure in the fish, are you using the same color or you're using multiple colors? It's a great question too. Uh, much of the work I showed today is using the same color. Uh, you, if you do do a uh, multicolor, which we, we, we have uh, uh, some of those, the earlier data sets we've repeated nicely and doing two colors at a time, you can do it a little bit faster. You do have to be very careful that your chromatic correction is accurate to the 3D cell that you're doing. Uh, and since these distances are very small and you're looking at population averages, we found if you, if you try to use just beads on the surface, uh, it's it's uh, not good enough. You can still mm -hmm. see if you ask, can I see that spatial difference between the, the color channels? Good, yeah, I was curious about aberrations. Thanks for clarifying. There's actually one question from uh, Tiang, Tiang Chi. Can you read it or should we help read it? It's on the uh, chat. Yeah, I think the question is, can you uh, mm -hmm. differentiate an allele specific interaction? Yeah, this is a very exciting question. Uh, it's not one our team has worked on a whole lot just uh, just yet. Uh, in, in collaboration with Ting Wu's lab, we did uh, some labeling of using some of the beautiful eel specific mm -hmm. oligo paints uh, that they had developed. Uh, and on, on that scale, one can very much separate uh, collections of uh, SNPs into different eels. Mm -hmm. Great. The data is also intrinsically separated into alleles as like you see the two separately. Uh, it's just we don't know who's maternal and paternal. Yeah, I, I have a, two questions maybe I can ask uh, uh, at the same time, but <laughs> you'll pick which ones you want to answer. Uh, I think the first is um, in terms of how the 3D genome, uh, 3D kind of DNA interaction control synergy expression, oh. since you are doing imaging, can you also see the downstream effects of, can you see actually how the, 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 trans, the transcription occurs uh, and the raging? Yeah. Uh, and then the, you, you get a you get an answer whether or not the actual controls the downstream uh, trans, uh, transcriptional activity. My second question is really like uh, um, yeah I'm an engineer I, I I'm not a uh, yeah I, I'm excited about the science what actually happens in animal but what I'm also thinking can you perturb that can you change that uh, if that three D interaction is is associated with certain disease can you kind of target that interaction to treat the disease? <laughs> yeah, uh, two great questions. I'll start with the uh, RNA and uh, tell what the structure is. I, I didn't talk about it today, uh, mm -hmm. but using those intronic labels, we can say to what aspects of the 3D structure correlate with transcription. Uh, the first take home for me there is uh, 
having enhanced promoter proximity does improve the probability of nascent transcription. You get a higher odds of correctly predicting is it transcribing or not, but uh, not, not very perfect. It's very much not a one-to-one -one, uh, connection. Uh, and some of that is possibly the temporal domain that these things are moving around so quickly enough that by the time we measure the transcript even coming off, whatever structure was associated with it. It's also possible that this, the, the biochemistry prior then to transcription has enough memory to decouple those processes that even if you were to uh, watch it in real time, the correlation would be uh, weak. Uh, we've actually also done some uh, uh, unbiased modeling with uh, machine learning to ask how much information is in their structure. And there, there is substantially more predictive information in the structure than we found in the enhanced motor contact. Though it's uh, it's a little tricky to unpack who's caused and who's correlate uh, from that alone. The, the, the second question uh, dealt with the uh, functional role uh, in development and can we perturb some of these contacts? Uh, and what, what I think uh, we're starting to be able to do is to use our lens in the 3D structure as a community, but especially perhaps enabled by these structures to understand the genetic data. So uh, I didn't tell you in PIDX1 that this uh, gene mutations around that enhancer are linked to uh, human disease uh, in uh, rare cases. And uh, some of them actually bring that enhance rather than delete the enhancer, which leads to a uh, defects in the hind limb, some bring it just a little bit closer to the promoter. And these actually lead to defects in, uh, in the forelimbs. So uh, changes that move around the contact frequency without changing the elements uh, really do seem to be uh, affecting the, the developmental outcomes. And uh, I think the more we understand the mechanisms of how that matters, I think we can better predict uh, yeah. these patients. Thanks. I think many more questions um, pop in the chat box. So Ame, you want? Sure. So you was asking, uh, even though the HIP1 and HIP2 cases also exist, could it be only the stacking is effective in enhancing the expression? For instance, detectable with the intron RNA labeling? Yeah, I think this is a very insightful, interesting question. Uh, for the same reasons we have, uh, we see weak associations between enhanced with motor contact and nascent transcription in the in the fixed cell imaging uh, in the pythorax. I think it's a it's a difficult one to rule out. I see two possibilities. One is it's possibly the only functional interaction happens in the domain stacking, and any interaction that happens in merging or whatever is is coincidental. I also think it's but not functionally regulatory on expression. I think it's also possible that actually a what the promoter really cares about is the absolute frequency and events per unit time that it sees this contact. That's enough to keep it in the active state. And it gets a portion of those at random through 3D diffusion, but that's not happening in any limb specific manner. And the boost that it gets on top of that in the hind limb by preferentially forming these stacked domains is what actually kicks the gene over. But if somehow you were to separate them and take away the, the free random component that's actually shared in both, it might be enough to, to not get expression in the hind limb too. So, so it's possible they're, they're all functional. Thank you. Any other questions? Please feel free to unmute. If GC, you have more questions, please feel free to ask, I think. So um, then if that's the case, I think it's almost 3.15 in the interest of time. Lex, thanks to uh, Dr. Bortiger again for this fantastic talk. And I'm gonna use this clapping sign again. And this was a great demonstration of how bio deep biology can be studied using spatial technologies. And thank you so much for this fantastic uh, presentation. And before we wrap up, I'd like to also uh, announce that next week we will have Dr. Jeffrey Spragans from Vanderbilt University, and he's going to be talking about multimodal imaging mass spectrometry, advanced technologies for molecular mapping of biological tissues. And with this, thank you everyone for participating and hope to see you guys next week.
Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alistair.